It's time to get educated on your Second Amendment rights. Welcome to two full hours of Gun Owners Radio. Your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Germisi, and Michael Schwartz will teach you about firearms, self-defense, and the laws that affect your rights to keep and bear arms. Visit GunOwnersRadio.com with questions to learn how to become a sponsor of Gun Owners Radio and get involved. Together, we will win. Now here's your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Germisi, and Michael Schwartz on The Answer San Diego. All right, folks, welcome to Gun Owners Radio FM 96.1 AM 1170. The Answer. This is episode 265, folks, if wow. you were counting. And we really want to welcome a new show sponsor, Scott uh, Vinson from Coldwall, uh, Coldwell Banking Royalty Realty. We are really very, very excited to have Scott join our show. As a sponsor, Scott is a San Diego County gun owner, board member, and has supported our efforts in defend and restore the Second Amendment from the start. So if you're moving, let or if you're moving, let f- fellow Second Amendment supporter and real estate broker Scott help you sell your home and find you a new home anywhere in the United States. Give Scott give Scott Vincent a call at 619-948-2459. Tell me you heard it right here on Gun Owners Radio. That's Scott Vinson at 619-948-2459. Scott's the best, and I, I saw he went uh, bird hunting over Did the he? weekend, too. Did yeah. he get a bird? Oh, he got a, I think he got a lot of birds. Mm. He got a lot of birds. Is there going to be a bird barbecue coming up? <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> ar, 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 ar. Yeah, he uh, just once a year, he hosts a barbecue for San Diego County Gun Owners yeah. in his backyard. Yeah. And uh, he goes back birds? to Alabama. No, he goes back to ba- Alabama, and he har- harvests the deer. And then he serves it up to everybody down wow. in uh, South County. It's delicious. Tasty. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. Good. He's a good cook. He's a good hunter. Uh, what else we got going on? Well, we got Mike and Brett from Christensen Combatives. We're mm-hmm. going to talk to them a little bit later, but they're in the studio. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. You bet. And of course, we have Melissa. Yep. She's going to give us our Hi. What are you, what are you reviewing this? this th- I'm, I'm reviewing their NVG class, their well, night vision a, class. That sounds awesome. You took it? I did. I took it. That's nice. And, of course, Joe's in the studio. What's up, man? Of course I'm here. <laughs> and, then of course, I'm here. So, uh, so we're golden. We're golden. Everybody's here. It's like the you know the Mickey Mouse Club uh, you know roll call there. Um, so, listen, everybody, we have to talk about this again. We have to talk about it multiple times. Vote yes on the recall. If you're just sitting back right now and not doing anything, or if you're posting memes on Facebook and thinking, okay, well, this is helping – uh, it's not. We have to get people out. We have to get them active. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are doing a lot of things that are doing direct support for this recall. This recall is crucial. If you're spending time arguing with somebody over who to vote for out of the 42 people or whatever, rather than just getting more people to show up and vote yes on the recall, you're actually doing damage. You're not helping the situation. We need people to uh, let re- I recall. Or I'm sorry, uh, 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 California, uh, Carl DeMaio's group. Um, Reform California? Reform California is doing a fantastic – boy, well, long weekend already. Reform California is doing a lot to help, and we're, we're sending people their way. Uh, what they're doing is they're actually getting a hold of people that maybe aren't going to show up and vote or don't even know there's an election, and they're giving them information and helping them show up and vote. That is actually changing the calculus. That's actually moving the ball forward. And there's lots of volunteer opportunities to do that. Nina's uh, making phone calls every night uh, for an hour for that organization. And, um, you know, the recall is kind of close, I think. The uh, the evil bad side is really nervous because they're bringing out um, all the big guns, Pelosi and Biden, and those people are all coming out here to uh, – to contribute on how their side. How can you which, say big guns? Well, you know, no, I'm thinking that that should be helpful for the recall. Effort, I know, but actually. how could you say big guns and mention that's, their names? That's what they got. <laughs> that's so, it. Honestly, that's it, a little it's, gun. It's I don't. It's, it doesn't appear to be as close. I, if the election happened tomorrow, we'd lose. Yeah, well, it's hard to say though because you, you. Well, get yeah, different but you can't say that until everybody yeah. votes. You can't say that until well, no, you votes. can't even look at those polls because no. they're, they're different. But, but the point is, people can't get complacent you can't relax we are no we are not anywhere near as close to even a possible victory for people to uh think hey this is this but is do we go. really know that yes i think there's more people don't think that 
I think they're willing to. I think no. I think these people. I think every single person I've talked to cannot wait because to to, to, to post their ballot because we live in a bubble. No, I think it's closer than you think it is. I, but I, that that still means though what you're saying is absolutely oh, right. Oh no, you no, can't you got to so, You, got, you so can't listen, be complacent. If, if go to the San Diego Democratic Party uh, Facebook page. Just start right there. It's the simplest thing in the, in the world. Go to their Facebook page. Look at all the efforts they are making at no on the recall. Mm -hmm. They're extremely organized and very motivated. Mm -hmm. The polls are showing that, yeah, it's a, a statistical dead heat, but a statistical dead heat in this situation means that the governor is about three or four percentage points ahead. But I heard there was the independence is about 23% that they have not voted as yet. Well, and and well, the other thing is, uh, Democrats are coming in stronger. Uh, they're getting their uh, their uh, ballots in earlier, mm -hmm. which doesn't really mean anything because no. that always happens. Democrats yeah. always turn ballots, their ballots from in. everywhere. Yeah, they they always turn their ballots in early. We we wait till the Republicans' right side of this political spectrum tends to wait till the day of. So that doesn't really mean anything. Okay, but the actual like you know polling, I've seen uh, uh, polling surveys. You know, and not like, you know, sponsored by the Democratic Party. I'm talking about, you know, really true, like, hey, we're doing our best to do a scientific poll on, mm -hmm. on likely voters. It's not, it, this isn't, it's not good. It's not like, hey, woohoo, we're going to win this thing. It's, oh, I would not, say, I would not say that either. But so let me, because I know you hate it when I bring up conspiracy theories because your <laughs> hair curls. But have you heard anything at all about the integrity of this vote? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of groups that are that are fighting for the integrity of of the of the uh, elections and everything. But here's the, the only reason I don't like. Now, look, I have my my views on that, but the reason I don't like to talk about that is it gives lazy people an excuse to stay. Well, home. Well, that's why I brought it up because if 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 you were to tell me, no, Dave, unfortunately, there's nobody looking, there's no going to be overseeing it, then then. There's going to be 10% will say, well, then why bother? There's a lot of groups that are out there doing everything they can. If somebody out there listening, if you're worried about the integrity of the election, then you need to get involved in organizations that are fighting for the integrity of the election. Right. Um, if you, if you, even if you think, hey, you know what? My vote's not going to matter. Okay, well, vote anyway. You, you know what I mean? Like, then, then yeah, why would you not matter. send, yeah, send <laughs> your vote in then? Because send they're going to take in. the 300 votes they found on that guy's car and they're going to submit them. If you're a so voter, yours is important. Or if you know somebody who's a voter and they're going, hey, I'm not going to vote because my vote doesn't matter. Well, just vote anyway then. Yeah. Like, you know, just be eh, humorous. Yeah. You know, send yeah. your vote in. But this 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 election, I you know, I, I think that this election is not going to be ruined by a, a voter integrity problem. I think that this vote, this uh, election is going to be ruined, and we're going to lose this thing because there are too many people out there that are complacent, and too many people out there that are fighting over you know person A versus person B rather than getting their neighbor who doesn't even know there's an election going on to show up and vote yes on the recall. Okay, so if and we actually, win, are you going to apologize for saying I'm in a bellow? I'm, I'm going to. I'll buy you a coke. Okay. How about that. <laughs> Joe, and, just, and not a diet coke either. I'll buy the full fledged. Oh, you got to borrow money from the. We'll wife. get the one from Mexico where they use the real sugar. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I, I got to tell you, seriously, I'm I'm very very worried. I watch the polling. I talk to people. Um, there are people that uh, uh, that oversee the the count at the uh, register of voters, which is where they count all the votes and where they send the ballots out and everything. And they're saying that uh, ballots are coming in and people are voting. For a candidate, and they're not voting yes on the recall. I, we're going to screw this up. We're going to screw this really? up. And we have, what, two weeks to make it right. So, what I'm saying is, whatever you're doing, uh, look up Reform California, get involved, help us out, find 10 people, make them show up to the polls. This is so close to victory, and we're going to pull defeat out of the jaws of victory, out of, uh, you know, uh, just being lazy. Yeah. Because California will just go down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper if we don't turn the tide. It's going to be a problem. If he wins, uh, if he doesn't get recalled, it's going to be an enormous problem. I hope you like masks and lockdowns because if he wins, that's what we're going to see again. And he'll punish every single one of us. Yeah. You know he will. All right. One of our most uh, popular guests is back, Clint Smith from Thunder Ranch. But first, self-defense and emergencies can happen to anyone, and there is no guarantee that the justice system will be on your side. Gun owners should have coverage for the legal battle after your self-defense battle. So while you protect your family and property, U.S. Law Shield is here to defend you 24-7, 365 days a year with comprehensive self-defense coverage at an affordable price. 
Bad guys don't take days off, and neither does our coverage. Guess what? Gun owner radio listeners, you can get two free months of coverage when you join. Use promo code American1 at uslawshield.com slash America. All right, so our guest is uh, needs no introduction, truly. Every time we have him on, we get a ton of positive feedback. Uh, he is a nationally known and respected firearms trainer from Thunder Ranch, which is in Oregon. That is a nationally known, uh, uh, well-known uh, training facility. And uh, so we're very, very happy to welcome Clint Smith back to the show. How are you, Clint? I'm fine, sir. How are you all today? Good. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted you to come on today. I wanted to talk about uh, shotguns. Um, I think that uh, I'm actually a big fan of, of, of the platform for when it comes to you know, home defense, self-defense, uh, or just in general. I, I think it's, uh, it's extremely underrated. Um, it's definitely underutilized by the public. You know, I know a, a ton of people with a dozen ARs and uh, you know, a dozen Glocks and zero shotguns. And I think that that's uh, that's a mistake. So I wanted, and I actually have a very specific shotgun question to ask you that I'm going to ask you a little bit later in the show. Um, but I just wanted to come on and, and talk about shotguns in general. Uh, give us the lay of the land. What are your thoughts in general on on the platform as far as uh, uh, you know people using it for for you know the everyday citizen using it for self defense? Well, I think uh, as far as home defense, I think it's uh, a very powerful gun. It has um, strength in that it based on the ammunition, probably won't shoot, shall we say, through as many walls in the case of a miss, like in the sense of like maybe a green chip AR round, you know what I'm saying? And most of the time, most handgun rounds will go through more walls than like a 55 grain um, ball from a 223 where the shotgun doesn't have that issue. I think the the big thing of just to lay of the land um, you got to know how to load the gun because it doesn't hold very much ammo. So a comparable gun in my mind's eye would be like a six shot revolver and a shotgun. Those are two guns that if you're going to have them and own them and use them, then you got to know how to load the gun. So probably with a shotgun, if I picked it up at O dark 30, I would fight with what's in the gun or on the gun. Um, so I think that probably, uh, rounds in the gun is good. And, you know, a lot of people want to answer that by getting a 10 round magazine extension. And that's awesome. I always tell people, great, but it with 10 rounds of double lock box and now hold the gun and ready for 20 minutes while you wait for the police to come. Um, the gun gets really heavy. So I'm not really, I like magazine extensions, but I don't use them the way that most people do. I always like, let's say it gives me two extra rounds. Yeah, I can hold four and then two more. Give me six. We'll say, I would load four and leave the two empty. That way, if I needed to transition to a different round, in other words, some of the people are going to live in a more built-up area, like um, the residential area where someone else might be a little more rural, and I might literally go outside and what appeared to be a buckshot shot now turns into a rifle slug. And I don't necessarily advocate rifle slugs for inside the house. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if I lived on a ranch or something, because we always think of California as L.A., and there's a lot more to California than L.A. Uh, you could say that again. Well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> You're absolutely right about that. Um, so, I, you know, shotguns are kind of – do you think it's accurate to say that they're easy to use and hard to be good at? No, I think the biggest thing, if someone asked me, I think it's the same thing that killed shotguns in the law enforcement community. If I was going to be king for a day, and I'm not, thank goodness, okay, I – would cut one inch off of every stock in America um, that was a shotgun uh, because most guns, most of the shotguns, the stocks are too long. Yeah. And so people are stretched out over the gun. And then when they're stretched, then the recoil is abusing. So a couple of things would be helpful. One, I might consider having a little bit shorter stock gun. I wouldn't have a pistol grip. I think they're goofy, but I won't go there. Um, the other thing I would do is we do have a remarkable redeeming value today that we didn't have 10, 15 years ago, and that's tactical ammunition. So it's still powerful, but it's not like shooting a three-inch magnum where it literally knocks your fillings out of your teeth. Um, so the tactical loads are going to be a lot more, um, shall we say, user-friendly. And um, bluntly, if the guy is five yards down the hall and I shoot him with a skeet load, he's going to know he's been shot. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I got it. I'd rather not shoot someone. And you know me. We've talked before. 
when I teach, I don't teach people about shooting people. That's not our job. But I also don't want my uh, family to be, you know, subjected to the whims of other people without their permission. So my preference would be a stock that fit, and then I would go with tactical ammunition. Well, and I, I'm a really basic guy. I don't like. I don't. I, I just. I'm not smart enough to use a lot of accessories and. And uh, I, I'm a really, really basic guy. So my, my Mossberg 500 is in a fairly basic setup. It's all fairly stock. Um, however, one of the best things I did was I got rid of the, the stock stock and got the uh, Magpul has a, uh, a stock that you can, you know, you can shorten. It's got the little little yeah. uh, little pieces in there. You can make it longer or shorter. And I made my, my shotgun stock really, really short. And you're absolutely right. Totally changed everything in a good way. Right. It's positive. And, you know, for you and I, if you just ask me, okay, Clint, give me the idea. I go, okay, great. The Magpul answers the idea of the stock. I personally would, if someone asked me, uh, like I always do, I would have a white light on the gun. And it it isn't so much that I'm going to go hunting, shall we say. Um, And you know what I mean by that. Um, But I don't want to shoot the wrong thing. And you know um, there's been numerous cases all over the United States, but especially in California, people shooting. Like, I heard a noise in the night. Well, the reason for a flashlight on a shotgun is like a reason for a light on a pistol or rifle. I use the light to find a light switch on the wall, which I'm going to turn on. And people go up, you turn the light on, they can see you. And I can see them back. And that way I'm not shooting my 21-year-old daughter who forgot her key and was sneaking in the back window or my three-year-old grandson who managed to figure out right tonight how to climb out of the crib now but when you compare the the platforms you know pistol rifle shotgun uh, i guess are the the three most general um, when you compare the the platforms would you would you would you discourage or encourage people uh towards shotguns as far as ease of use um i so I have a really simple sort of thing in my head. Handguns put holes in people. Rifles put holes through people. And a shotgun, right range, right load, will take a chunk of meat off and fling it on the wall. And that's always a good thing in a fight. It wasn't very pleasant, but it's truthful. That said, the shotgun, um, you got to know how to load the gun. That's the single biggest thing. Like if I have like shotgun schools, which I do, and it's not a sales pitch, it's just true. If I have shotgun schools... I really pound people for three days on loading the gun, loading the gun, loading the gun, loading the gun, because it won't take very long. You know, people go like, well, you know, um, see, I'm never worried about, like, I don't own a stopwatch. Like, literally, a school, I don't own a stopwatch. I'm never worried about people shooting fast. If people get scared, they'll shoot fast. What I need for them to do is shoot good. And what people don't understand is it's a shotgun inside most people's homes It's actually a rifle because the pattern hasn't opened up enough. So if I gave them a visual, you remember like old ice cream cones that look like dunce hats. So at the end of the muzzle, the pattern is going to be an inch. Yeah. A yard from the target is going to be two, okay, then three, then four. And at 10 yards, which is 30 foot, that's a long ways down the hallway, they're going to have a lot of nominal 10-inch patterns. But people have this idea they, you know, watch way too many John Wayne movies, okay, about like, um, you know, I pulled the trigger and it put a pellet in every square foot of the wall. Yeah. I'm sorry it doesn't happen that way, okay? I mean, I I got it. You know, the people go, well, if I got a short barrel, it will. No, it won't. All the choking is in the last two inches of the gun. And so if I have a 30-inch full gun and I slam it in the car door and bend it, now I cut it off to 28, which, of course, is legal, okay? That still... It's going to make the gun nothing but a straight pipe. Now, will it have a little bit more velocity because that has a 28-inch barrel, barrel compared to 18? Yes, but the pattern is not going to be that much better, okay, unless you do some magic stuff with screw and chokes and all that kind of stuff. And while we're there, between you and I, I don't advocate screw and chokes for fighting shotguns. Um, and a lot of people, oh, no, that's wrong. Okay, well... That's why it's called America. I still get to choose so far, okay, at least this week. So the deal with it is um, I don't like stuff that has the ability to go down range. And if I had $5 for every screen choke I've seen go down range in the last 40 years, I'd have a lot of money. I, well, I, I think you're right. My uh, my defensive shotgun, none of my defensive shotguns have a, have a screw-in choke. 
And I can tell you my uh, well, at least one of my barrels for the shotgun I use when I go do sporting clays, every single stage I'm checking to make sure that it's still screwed in. So right. that's I agree. And, and I don't want to have to check that in a fight. I already right. have enough problems. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I don't want to be checking that in a fight either. <laughs> yeah, and it's nothing ugly. And, and people go, well, I have a really good screen choke. And, good. I, I, okay, great. No problem. You know, that's the great thing still about all of this, all right, so far. You know, it's free will, free choice. You get to pick, you know. Um, you want a screen choke? Wear a screen choke. You know, if you don't want to wear a mask, that's your call. You know, you want <laughs> You want to vote for one governor candidate and not the other? You know, that it's still, yeah, you know, we need to be careful. Like uh, I was listening, and you're exactly right. People can't sit on their hands and go let someone else do it, you know. Um, the world is kind of covered, and there's even some new fresh ones with the graves of people from this country who died so we can vote. So they need to vote and not rely on someone else to do it. But I'm not getting off subject. I'm just telling you it's sort of the same thing in the joke. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, now, I want to ask you, I'm not sure we have enough time. Yeah, we're going to go to the yeah, next segment. But here's what I want to ask you about. Well, we're in the uh, in the in the commercial here. Uh, I want to ask you about the difference between a semi-automatic shotgun and a pump-action shotgun and talk about you know maybe, maybe kind of the pros and cons of both and what you think of those. And I also want to talk to you about ammunition. I've been asking this question uh, of a lot of guys that have a lot of experience teaching shotgun classes um, you've already kind of kind of set it up for me with some of the discussion on buckshot and everything, but I want to talk about those two th- things specifically. And again, we're we're doing this segment. I'm I'm really passionate about about uh, shotguns for defensive use, so I'm really encouraging people out there to get a shotgun and get training. That's that's the whole point of this. But uh, I, I want to get as much good information out there as we can. So. All right, Clint. Hopefully you wrote that down because he's gonna he's gonna forget <laughs> what he wanted to ask you. Our so. freedom of speech is just as important as our freedom of self defense. Amen. And we are thrilled to support an American company like My Pillow. Go to mypillow.com and use the code Free Market Three and get up to sixty six percent off America's best pillows. You can get a great night's sleep and enjoy the satisfaction of supporting companies fighting against cancel culture. That's MyPillow.com. And use the code FIRE, free market 3 for up to a 60 cents percent discount. That's pretty good. All right, we're back with Clint Smith from Thunder Ranch. How you doing, buddy? We're talking shotguns. You know, we have a couple guys in the studio here, Brett and Mike, and they're uh, uh, former special op guys from, uh, from the Coast Guard. Right? I got that right, man. Yep. And I, everybody I talk to about shotguns, when you start talking about shotguns, no one has a negative opinion about shotguns. You know, if they know what they're talking about, they're like, oh, yeah, of course, you know. People have varying opinions on pistols and, and rifles and ARs and meh, 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 meh. You know, no, you shouldn't, whatever. Shotguns are, but yeah, yep. If, you, if everyone I know who, have, who knows what they're talking about, when you bring up shotguns, they go, yes, absolutely. It's a great platform. People should know it better. Why do you think it's not more popular? Why aren't more people uh, using, buying, and training with shotguns, Clint? Well, I think the big thing is, is it goes back to what we talked about just briefly ago. When in my time as a, a cop, I can remember that when people had to qualify with handguns, it was no big deal, and it's somewhat rifles. But when you went to shotgun, you'd have grown men almost start to cry. <laughs> and I think the deal wow. with it was was the ammunition. Okay, like I said, in my day, a cop, you know, from in the seventies, okay, was like three inch magnums were that was the bread and butter. But the problem with it is, it just beats the crap out of people. And so, like, I don't care who you are, okay? I mean, I know a couple maniacs um, who will, like, go out and shoot, you know, a truckload of three-inch mags, but I'm not one of those guys. I mean, I, like, uh, I don't mind shooting the thing, and I, um, but, uh, and people go, like, well, you know, three-inch mag hits harder. Well, how hard do you want to hit them? I mean, if you hit him with number four buck, you know, I'm putting 27 pellets on the guy. Um, and based on distance to target, you know, it, it's going to be a reasonably effective. I think the thing is, is the stocks are too long. The ammo is the issue. And then no one really took the time to train people how to use the gun effectively, like in the sense of loading it. So the deal with it is it was much easier. And, you know, I, I go through this because, you know, I, without sounding like a sales pitch, I've written some books on rifles. And I mentioned in there that when we went to rifles, everyone goes, yeah, we need to have this. And I go, well... If your rifle program is not going to be any better than your shotgun program as far as the amount of ammunition and training, then there's no sense in changing. Okay, so like, um, you know, I can uh, when I do a shotgun class, people love it, man. They're just like, you know, but 
you got it. There's shortcomings. You know, the most consistent thing about a shotgun is that it's inconsistent. I can take five consecutive serial numbers, and I can shoot the same ammunition through them, and every one of them will pattern differently. Mm. I, 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 that doesn't bother me. You know, one of the greatest things that shotguns ever did was they had the five-round box of ammo. So I would go to a gun store, and I would buy one of every five boxes of ammo they had. And then I would shoot it on paper, and I would find out. Because, like, one gun will like Remington Slugs and Winchester Buck, and one gun will like just the opposite. And it doesn't matter for you and I because we're in the private sector. Where it gets the police in trouble is they buy ammunition in bulk, so they have to buy ammunition that doesn't always perform. And then they go, well, I shot at 50 yards, and I didn't hit the guy with nine pellets. Well, at 50 yards, you're trying to build a custom cabinet with a chainsaw. <laughs> you know, that's not actually where the gun really works. You know, the optimum range for the gun is 10 yards to 30 yards. And after that, if it's past 30, then you got to expect holes in the pattern as far as it's doing it. So then, based on if I was like a Border Patrol guy and down by the Mexican border, maybe and I had a shotgun, uh, then I might want rifle sights on it, and then I'd want to have a rifle slug capability. So if the guy was 200 yards away, I don't have to lay in a ditch and let him shoot at me. I can put a rifle slug in and shoot back. You know. So um, so Clint, you're, you as you're as you're making all these points, both our guys here, uh, Brett and Brett and Mike are, are both nodding in agreement. Well, they look means, like the bobbleheads. Yeah, as soon as you make, they're both like, yep, yep, yep. Which you know, and I these guys are both know what they're talking. I don't know what they're talking. I got this job on the radio here because of my looks. Um, these yes. guys are, and your voice are are qualified to to agree with you. Okay, so here's my question. I've been asking a you bunch. You remembered, of people. yeah. So uh, the default, everybody, you know, ha, you know, use double lot buck. buck. Uh, typically, there's nine pellets. Uh, it's it's as standard as as standard gets as far as as you know a defensive round for shotgun. Yep, double lot buck. Um, the, the the trend, though, and as we all know, you have to aim a shotgun. And that's a common myth that, oh, you just point it in the general direction. You know, that's not true. We all know that. Um, in fact, the trend has been like these flight control rounds that have really, really, really tight patterns. So right. that those. You think, yeah. Go on, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So the so the uh, so those nine pellets are. It's a really, really, really tight pattern. I mean, it really on my shotgun um, out till about ten yards. It's it's one hole. It's one big hole. Those nine pellets pretty much create one big hole. You get past. So you got you got the value of the ammo. So that's when I mentioned tactical ammo and the bobbleheads were now up and down. Two things save the ammo. One, okay, our flight control wads, and the other is by plating the pellets. When we used to use only lead, when they went down the barrel or slid or skid or whatever word you want. We would get a pellet, okay, that had a flat side on it, and then we would have eight pellets on the target and one that went to Wyoming. And people go, well, what the hell is that? And I go like, well, the deal with it is by nickel plating them or copper plating them and put them in flight control, that has been the salvation of the shotgun. But if I can get people to carry ammo on the gun and make the stock fit them, now we got the true winner. So, and, and here's my question. And like I said, when I pattern my shotgun out to 10 yards, it's one hole. Out to 15 yards, you might start seeing a little bit of a spread with my shotgun. And But that seems right. to be pretty standard. I don't think that's 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 too far off from most shotguns that are set up for self-defense, I don't think. Um, here's my question. If we're doing this, if we're getting the double-op buck, um, which I think became the self-defense ammo because it was the best thing at the time, and now they're continuing to improve it, um, which makes a lot of sense. But if, if we're doing all that with double op buck to make these nice tight patterns, why aren't we all, why aren't we switching to slug for self-defense? Well, slug the rifle and it's going to carry a long ways. You know, you know, from my past that I worked at gunsight and when I was with Mr. Cooper, he was a, he owned a shotgun. Okay. But he stuffed it full of slugs because his basis for his marksmanship was based on shooting rifles, not necessarily. In other words, he's not like you. He's not like a sporting clays guy. I don't even know if they had sporting clays then. But the point of it is, is he turned a shotgun into a rifle. And yet I dealt with another guy who was an Olympic gold medalist, okay, and he wanted everything to be BBs and smaller pellets. And my deal was I visualized a shotgun in my head. If you can imagine a 90 or 180-degree arc, when I teach, I teach what we call a spectrum of the shotgun. One of the greatest books that people can buy is the Shooter's Bible. I don't sell them, so I can't get in trouble. But the point of it is, 
go in the back and look at all the different ammunition types that are available. I mean, there's probably a hundred variations of birdshot. So this is where you start to learn the tool. It's not like I'm going to take an Indy 500 car out and drive it the first day in the race. In other words, I, I got some practice with it. So the, the ammunition, I mean, it's a series of, it was a series of errors before, you know, the stock was, I mean, okay. So, Think of it this way, for when we talk about the kind of gun, if you ask me straight up, if someone goes, I'm going to have one shotgun, what should I have? I go a pump gun. And they go, yeah, but an auto loader shoots faster. I'm not worried about it shooting fast. I'm worried about it chambering all the rounds that I'm going to put in it. And if I would have said that 100 years ago, the bobbleheads would have definitely been nodding because paper used to swell. Now we have all plastic. And in World War I, all the cases for shotguns were made out of brass. So they couldn't swell. Okay. So I think a pump gun is more liable to accept more, shall we say, berries of ammunition, including yeah. even some for damage. And I am pretty sure if I can get it in the mag tube, I can get it in the chamber. If I can get it in the chamber, I can get the gun to go off. I also, a lot of times, if you get new semi automatics, okay. Um, you try to put like skeet loads on them and they're not powerful enough. They're either right. gas operated or inertia operated. And so for me, it kind of goes, okay, great. What kind of shotguns do you have, Clint? I have about seven pump guns and one semi automatic. And the semi automatic is in the back shelf. Okay. And everything else is a pump gun. But I admit, I grew up with pump guns. So I'm not, I have no anxiety about that. I, you know, I've seen that in classes and on the range that the, uh, the semi autos, like you said, they're people, try, you know, they're basically turning a shotgun into a rifle. And the semi autos are a little finicky when it comes to ammo sometimes. And that doesn't make me feel comfortable. Um, you know, but, but here's, but let me, let me go back to the ammo question, though. Is there something in the ballistics? Is there something in the, uh, uh, you know, do, do the nine pellets, if, if you have nine pellets that make a hole that would be about the same sized hole as a, uh, as a slug, um, you know, is there something about the ballistics of having nine little pellets that is, uh, you know, more lethal, uh, more lethal? That, that, that... Oh, I don't know. Here's, here's the thing. You've been in the business a while. So like you hear people go like, Hey, don't shoot them in the same hole. Cause if you shoot, um, four inches apart, you'll have two wound channels. Well, I can't argue that. But at the same time, if you and I were to go to Alaska and we got involved in a plane crash and we were lucky enough to live and all I had was nine pellets or even more importantly, all I had was skeet loads, I would go at the base where the wad ends inside the case and I would scribe it with a knife. And then when I shoot that bitch, I'm telling you what, that plastic end will come off and make it a rifled slug. So as far as it being lethal, it might be knowledge and the ability to manipulate your ammunition based on the environment that you're in. If I had no slugs and wanted a slug, that's exactly what I would do. Is it the smartest thing? No, because once in a while you can get a piece of plastic caught in there or something. But compared to being eaten by, you know, a 900-pound bear, I'm cutting the stomach bitch and shooting them. Okay, excuse me. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, hey, it's hey, a family guys, show, Clint. Come so, on. So, Clint, let, <laughs> you mentioned this about two or three times within your interview. And I, and I just, for the people out there that are listening, because we have a lot of new listeners, what did you mean by the biggest problem you've seen was loading the shotgun? What, what did you it mean by that? Hold, it doesn't hold very much ammo. If you take a standard 870 out of the box, it'll hold one in the chamber and four in the tube. So if, like, you have a Mossberg 500, okay, it might have an extension up, so it may hold six. So the idea is is that people go like, well, the show's great big. It won't be hard to load. It is hard to load when your heart rate's 250. You have a wet spot in your shorts, and a guy's coming down the hallway with a big knife. So personally, I would, like, have the mag tube, like I told you, but not necessarily for loading it unless we were in the zombie apocalypse, okay? That said, I personally would put, like, four rounds in the gun, and then I would have a side saddle mounted on the side that held four or six rounds additionally. And then I, if I needed to change the flavors, because I lived in Pump Handle, Montana, and I needed to have the back two be rifled slugs, then that's what I would do. But they don't hold much ammo. And when people, what they forget is that people, I'll take them in a tactical house, okay? And they'll go, bang, 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 bang. And I go, how many rounds you fire? And they go, two. And I go, well, there's five pieces of nine millimeter brass on the floor so how do we account for that <laughs> uh i'm sorry but everyone talks about being really cool 
But if you think you're going to die, <laughs> there's a whole other story. Yeah, all Let other me, story. Real, real quick, last question. Thumbs up, thumbs yeah. down. Clint, if I said, hey, I'm going to change all my double out buck uh, defensive ammo to like a low recoil slug, would you thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down. I wouldn't want you shooting them inside your house. Okay. That's Excellent. all I needed here. Hey, how do people follow you and find out what the heck you're doing? Uh, they can just uh, go online and put Thunder Ranch, Oregon. And um, uh, there's, if I could address one thing very quickly, okay, there's been some discussions back and forth about the ranch, uh, the physical ranch slash Thunder Ranch, the property, the 900 acres is for sale. Uh, I'm 72. I'm not 22. I'm also not 82. So I don't plan on retiring. I plan to teach. And, you know, for anyone who might be listening who hasn't got to work, whatever classes we have scheduled, we're finishing. And we also, like, already have stuff set up for next year. So uh, I think I'm going to teach a class a week after I die just because I'm more angry. <laughs> I, I want to take that class. Man after my own heart. Thanks, buddy. Stay out of trouble, and we'll talk to you down the road. What do you think? Is the Biden administration punishing Russia or U.S. gun owners more by banning Russian ammo? Duh. We'll talk about that next. Did you know a lot of Biden gun shops and manufacturers had their credit card processing shut down? Why? Because their vendors think guns are inappropriate. Well, shutting down businesses that support your constitutional right to self-defense is wrong which is why we are so excited to have 365 Glacier Payments as a 10-ring partner. 365 Glacier Payments specializes in companies in the firearms industry. And if you have a business that accepts credit cards, give them a call today so you can enjoy the peace of mind that your account won't be shut down and also enjoy the best rates. You can visit their website at 365glacierpayments.com and for a free account review, and if they can, can't beat your credit card processing rates, they'll pay you one hundred dollars. All right, now we're gonna just bring on our good buddy, Mister Joe Gervisi, the covert blogger. What are you chatting about this week, my friend? Aren't you gonna tell him? All right, I'll, I'll yeah, tell I'm him. I guess you because I can't. <laughs> So I, can't, I can't even say that name without my stomach turning. <laughs> so the Biden administration says yet. That's the one I wanted to hear you say. To uh, cheap <laughs> Russian ammunition. I could say yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the State Department has decided that the, uh, the Russians can't import ammunition and firearms into the country anymore. And this will take effect on September 7th. And interestingly, this is part of... Um, part of the uh, Chemical and Biological Weapons Control and Warfare Elimination Act of 1991. Mm. Uh, and this is a sanction, officially, against the Russians. This is supposed to be um, punishing the Russians for misbehavior. And um, it says that, uh, that it has to last at least 12 months. And then after that, uh, the executive branch can undo it or do away with it, but they have to certify to Congress that the, the Russians have met their conditions. So what? what? What what have they done to get into trouble? Well, I mean, I'll tell you. So yeah, so it has to go at least twelve months. So President Harris could undo it a little bit later in her term. President who? But um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's got to stay at least twelve months. So what the Russians did was they attempted to poison somebody that was unhappy with Putin and their government, a um, an opposition person named Aleski uh, Naval Navalny, I think. Um, and uh, they poisoned him with a nerve agent, which is what puts them in violation of the treaty. Mm. And they are not the treaty, but the uh, that agreement that they had. And uh, the Russians argue, though, that they're this is a newer version of that nerve agent. So even if they did do it, it really wasn't under that treaty. <laughs> what? But um, that's the, that's the I shot the sheriff, but I didn't shoot the deputy <laughs> defense. Yeah, no kidding. Well, apparently all that <laughs> stuff works because I mean, you know, it's. And it's, it's interesting, too. And I think this is more of just another example of, again, this certain um, political party. And did extremists. our government say, oh, son of a gun, you're absolutely correct. I apologize. No, they didn't. They said, we're, we're barring you from uh, selling ammunition in the United States. Do you buy Russian ammo? And uh, Well, no, it's interesting. Um, I have. I, I did it once. And, um, and actually, I did it a, a month or so ago because it's, it's cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. Um, than the regular, like uh, our inflated ammo right now for nine millimeters, about somewhere around 60 cents a round, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I bought a thousand rounds of the Russian steel cased ammo for uh, $400, so about 40 cents a round. 
So it's significantly cheaper. Um, I don't use it or haven't used it before because I reload. And uh, the cases are steel, so I can't reload them. So it's kind of a waste for me. So I use brass ammunition. You trust them? Um, I, well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I have friends that shoot it regularly and have no problem. The ones that I bought, um, I was having problems in my Glock. And it's like the only thing that the Glock does not like. Um, and uh, I was having misfires. And um, what someone was telling me is the, uh, the material they use for the primers is a little bit harder than the material that we use in, in typical ammo. So sometimes the striker fired guns like the Glocks uh, aren't happy with it. Cause I was, when I first started using that, I was having a misfire like every magazine, which is, is just not, not cool. <laughs> so, um, but I've, I've seen catastrophic, pro I think the only people they're punishing by not selling Russian ammo in the United States are gunsmiths who make a lot of money off of well, see, and that's yeah. and I don't, guns they got. <laughs> so I could I could speak to the nine millimeter anyway. I know I, I have several friends that shoot that don't reload that use that religiously because it's cheaper. Um, I found that in my wife's uh, Ruger PC carbine, it works fine. I shoot it all day, so that's how I'm going to burn up the thousand rounds that I have. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, you know, one of the problems with this is, you know, people people are going to look at this because you say, okay, how does this affect gun owners? And people are going to look at this, you know, unfortunately, the, the same way gun owners look at a lot of stuff. It's the, the, you know, not my, not my circus, not my monkeys approach. You know, so I don't use that stuff anyway. Who cares? And the reason you should care is because we already have a shortage of ammunition and we have a shortage of, of primers and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and that's going to keep going for a while. And what this is going to do is it's going to make that shortage even worse. And it's going to drive up the prices even more. Because uh, depending on who you listen to, um, like the National Shooting Sports um, Foundation said that uh, about that makes up about eight percent of the ammo sold in America. Uh, all the way at the other end, John Lott is saying it could be as much as forty percent of the ammo sold in America. So wait, wait. So the one saying that eight percent of the ammo sold is Russian, and John uh -huh. Lott saying it's as much as forty. That's what Lott was saying. Unfortunately, he doesn't reference in his article. He doesn't reference where he got that number. So I'm guessing it's, you know, I saw uh, like uh, Greg Elifritz is saying 20 to 30 percent. So I'm guessing it's probably somewhere in the middle. It's probably 15 to 20 percent or something. Whatever it is, though, you know, it's going to hurt. It's the, significant. The shortage. Well, yeah, because now people that used to buy that are now not going to be able to buy it anymore because it's already gone. I was uh, talking to him at LAX Ammo yesterday. And, yeah, it's gone. They're, they don't have any more. And um, so – you know, people are, that would normally buy that are going to have to buy the other stuff. So, again, that's going to exacerbate the shortage that's already there. It's going to make the prices, you know, stay high because things were starting to come down a little bit. Um, it was, you know, it's still, like I said, about three times what it should be. Um, you know, I was telling you that uh, well, I just bought, um, what did I, buy? I just, uh, just got a thousand rounds of nine millimeter the other day, almost 60 cents a round. You know, normally that should be 19 or 20 cents a round. And, uh, you know, and this is going to continue because if you look at how this got driven up in the first place, you know, between this this stuff that the government's doing with COVID, this panic that they're creating, and um, all the mostly peaceful protesting we had last year, because we're only realistically, you know, we're one dead criminal away from more, you know, mostly peaceful protests. And <laughs> people are freaked out and panicked. So, I mean, you still, if you look to try to buy guns, I mean... Uh, Guns are still mostly out of stock in a lot of places. I mean, it's not quite as bad as it was a few months ago, um, but it's still bad. Uh, ammunition, again, like I said the other day, still 60 cents a round for 9 millimeter, And that's going to continue for a while, and I think this just um, just makes it worse. It's just going to make it continue. Well, and, I, and it, you, you know, it doesn't matter if you use Russian ammo, if you like Russian ammo, if you like Russians. Um, it, it, that's not really what we're talking about here. Um, your point is this is just another way to harass gun owners. It is a you know, control factor. They've they've weaponized the State Department to use against gun owners. That, that's all this is. You couldn't think of anything else to sanction with the Russians because you're unhappy with something you think they did. I mean, you know, it's just uh, it's not so, the cyber attacks. We want to leave that no, alone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't do that. And we actually told them what. Hey, could you not attack these areas because this will yeah, be bad. Here's, here's a list of sixteen. Yeah. Companies don't touch them. Well, it's like giving the Taliban the you know the names of the people. Hey, can you help us get these guys? Sure. Well, in the real world, uh, Mike, I mean, you guys do training. How much has the ammo 
issue, the expensive, uh, the expense that, that's spiked in ammo and, and just the inability to find ammo, how much has that affected your business? Um, I wouldn't say our business specifically. I think we try to adjust our training plan to, to bring more value and don't just go to that 1,000 round range a day like, you know, some of these classes you get to take. But, yeah, people are definitely hesitant to, uh, to come because it takes time. You know, back in, what, six months ago, you get 50 rounds in one day. If it's a 500 round minimum, yeah. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing too. Like uh, last year, even when we were at Front Sight last year, they've you know you're in a four day class and they've reduced the round count a bit, which um, you know I mean it's not just about shooting rounds, but but still if you can't shoot as much as you know as an instructor, if you can't shoot as much as you plan to do, so now I have to make that up with other stuff, which I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't keep the class good and everything, but it does have an impact on that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, you have to think it has an impact on law enforcement and all the other people that have to train with it because it just makes things tighter and more expensive for everybody. Um, even the reloaders and, and, like, you know, I used to shoot matches every Saturday. And since all this started, I mean, I rarely shoot a match now. And I, and I know my skills have just dropped way off, but I can't reload anymore. I can't find primers. And, uh, you know, this is just going to aggravate that, I think, and make it worse. So there is a way to fix it, though. Like Michael was talking, we got an opportunity here in a week or so, recalling this governor. Yeah. Um, we could do it again in November of 22 and again in November of 24, so we can fix it. Hey, what are this. we talking about now? Nobody told me what's going on in the segment. We have Brett and Mike from Christensen Combatives to talk about night vision. Man, you guys always leave me in the dark. <laughs> oh, my but, um, God. Did huh? you really say that? I just said it. I know you did. <laughs> Hey, did you know John Dillon is the attorney on the Miller versus Bontis case and the Jones versus Bonta case as well? Well, in other words, he's working to remove the assault weapon ban and working to restore the Second Amendment rights for 18 to 21 year olds. And if you have legal matters that involve firearms and you need to call attorney John Dillon, especially if you have questions about red flag laws, gun registration, gun transportation. Or maybe you just need to know if your guns are California compliant. Call our trusted firearms attorney, John Dillon. John Dillon specializes in California gun laws. That's 760-642-7150. 760-642-7150. Or you can visit them on the web at dillonlawgp.com. All right, Melissa, what do you got for us? Well, usually I have uh, a gear review for you guys. Um, this time I am going to be doing... A training review for you. I recently took, was a couple weeks ago, I took um, an yep. NVG class with Christensen Combatives. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, this is amazing. If you guys can um, get this experience and um, be a part of it, do it. Because this taught me a lot of stuff that I never <laughs> knew that I, mm -hmm. uh, I should be knowing. But I mean, it's not like I'm going to have money to go out and buy night vision goggles. But it was a fun experience um, to to go through the motions and be like, you know, I feel like I'm completely blind up close when I'm trying to do manipulations with my rifle and everything. So um, that taught me a lot. And knowing your rifle through and through, your pistol through and through, in with your eyes closed. Like, I knew that that was something I'm like, I need to know these things. I was borrowing a rifle. I was borrowing a pistol that I've never used before. So it was... It made a little curvier learning curve That's for me. not the right answer. Let's start <laughs> things off right there. <laughs> so I have here Brett, um, owner of Christensen Combatives, and Mike. Um, so thank you guys for joining me today. Thank, thank you for having you. us. So tell me more about um, the night vision. Tell everybody else about the night vision class and what to expect. Yeah, so the night vision is something we're trying to do uh, more regularly. Um, our friend that owns all the equipment out of Arizona coming in, bringing that all. It's just a whole different dynamic. Like you said, are you going to necessarily go out and buy a $10,000, $5,000 set of uh, night vision goggles and the lasers and everything to equip with it? Well, maybe, because we did have a few people that had all their own equipment there. So True. it just kind of depends where you want to go. But it is a nice training opportunity. Uh, and it also, like you said, kind of gives you the idea of, hey, I need to know my equipment even in the dark. Um, yeah. We train at day mostly. So even if you don't have the night vision capability, uh, when's a home intrusion going to happen? Probably at night, at night in the dark. So knowing your equipment uh, that way, which, as you said, it kind of taught you that like, oh, how is this all set up? So, yeah, I've never worn the chest rig. I've never um, 
first of all, the rifle, I, I should have practiced more with a rifle that I was unfamiliar with. Um, manipulations, changing mags and all that stuff. I was like, okay, do I have the tips in the right direction before I, you know, put the magazine in? Because I don't want to put it in backwards or whatever. I was just like, okay, you need to, this is something that's a big learning curve and this is something that you need to know. So when I buy a rifle, I'm going to be training with it in the dark as well. Yep. At least some kind of low light situation. Something. And then, like I said, if you've got that capability and you want to go to that next level and that night vision is what's going to take you there. Right. So um, within the military world, that's how you, you know, quote unquote, own the night is through that. So it allows a much greater capability. So I want to tell everybody that this is just not a let's shoot guns in the dark with nods on. It's not like that. They actually <laughs> go through useful drills. So that's what I really liked about yours is that, OK, do this drill, do this drill, do this drill. And then you, you ran two lines and everybody did the drills. I really like that. Yep. So it was it was useful. It wasn't just like, let's just blast away in, in the dark with nods. No, there's no training value in that. Exactly. And you're paying for the course. You're paying, as we discussed expensive for your ammo so let's make the most of you know get the best bang for your buck right so tell me what other um classes you guys offer um we kind of do everything from a uh, level one beginner never shot a pistol before uh a level two just building onto that to our combat pistol which is all the shoot move communicate uh piece of the puzzle uh we do carbine work uh coming up we're gonna be doing a uh, combat carbine course along with the combat pistol and then we also offer land navigation basic survival skills and moving into the mid-range rifle uh, kind of that 600 to 800 meter mark just taking your average carbine see what it can do with a good optic not a crazy you know break the bank optic uh, and then we're also moving into the close contact fighting world as well bringing in some new instructors to help us with that piece of the puzzle Mike, um, where are you guys training at? Uh, primarily, we train out in uh, Paula at uh, North County K9. It's uh, Dustin Wen. He owns that facility, and he's been gracious enough to let us uh, on the property. It's a beautiful piece, 1,800 acres, just right off the 76, which is unheard of. And he has shoot houses, ranges, uh, long rifle ranges, uh, fast rope towers, cars that we can move on the range. So it's, it's very dynamic and, and mobile. Hmm. Well, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, possibilities out there are you guys gonna build a new shoot house out there yeah we've got a lot of plans out there actually so <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be building a new shoot house out there uh range improvements getting that going uh kind of the sky's the limit out there and we are going to take every opportunity to build a decent uh, training facility in the area for everybody to come in whether civilian leo military yeah. get it all going well i'm excited to take your new class because these guys are going to be the ones training me for rifle you guys are going to get uh -oh. me squared away with rifle. Mm -hmm. And Mike says, we're going to teach you from the ground up, which is great because yep. like, that's what I need. <laughs> so I've started with pistol from ground up. Now I need to do rifle. So and then I would like you guys to help me build my own rifle. Tell me which parts I need. So that's easy. That's easy. That's the easy part. Okay. Um, so what's the website, Instagram, and all that good stuff? Uh, you can find us at ChristiansonCombatives.com on Instagram, Christensen Combatives. Facebook Christians and Combatives, we've made it very easy <laughs> to find us. So, <laughs> Okay. And then typically, um, how long are your classes? Are they usually just one day or classes? Are they two day or classes? Uh, the combat pistol and rifle are traditionally a two day. We're trying something new coming up recently. It's going to be a one day course for each one of those. Uh, the beginner courses are always just a one day course. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how the one day course pans out because what we're kind of finding is two days is a lot of commitment for people. Uh, whether it's time or the uh, ammunition expenditure as well. So we're going to play with that a little bit. Okay. All right. So the only question I have, are you the model on your T-shirt? I am. That is my face. <laughs> I wondered about that. Nobody said nothing. Everybody's staring at it. So if you see a Christensen combative guy about the size of a Volkswagen and he's got his picture on his shirt and it looks like him, it's him. It's me. Again, how do people find you? Well, we got a website as website, well. Website christiansoncombatives.com and on Instagram and Facebook. All right. Well, hey, it's it's did you have a question? Well, I was gonna talk, tell people a little bit about your background too. Like why yeah. 
Oh yeah, oh. you got a couple minutes. Yeah. Why, yeah why, quick, why do you know so much about this? Yeah, stuff? you were in the Coast Guard. What we're do they? Coast what do they yeah, know so what about we we're supposed to be stuff. Uh, checking, you know, life jackets out on the bay. Yeah, which... and picking up cocaine. I mean, yep. that's your only job. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, no, we both have a similar background uh, in the counter drug and counter terrorism world yeah. in the Coast Guard, uh, the Pulable Specialized Forces. So, uh, are you saying those people with all those drugs are bad people? They and were, they might shoot at you? Never, never. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's kind of funny because people think about the orange boat out there checking the life jackets. Yeah. That's- I've never done one of those boardings myself. Uh, I think Mike might have had the opportunity to do a couple, but yeah. we've both kind of been in a uh, different path in the Coast Guard that most people are like, really, this exists? Yeah. So, Well, nobody, you you don't think about that when you hear Coast Guard. Nope. You, you, that's not a topic. I mean, I was shocked when you guys were telling me, you know, where you came from. I mean, no offense, you look like SEAL Team 6. So <laughs> I'm just assuming. And then he goes, yeah, we were in a Coast Guard. I mean, I went, Coast Are you guys going to be teaching a class on submarine surfing? Yeah. <laughs> that we're going to be uh, coming up with, yes. That's a three-day <laughs> class. That's a three-day, Do you yeah. know that guy? Are you yeah. allowed to say whether you know that guy or not? Uh, he does live here in San Diego. But yeah, and we'll leave it at that. Say anything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We'll leave if it you guys, that. everybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, there just Google like Coast Guard submarine boarding, something like that. And there's a something video of a, yeah, there's a video of a guy standing on a submarine. It, it was a drug runner. Um, anyway, it's, yeah, what, it's, what, you, it, it's right there with Red Dawn. Yeah. Right next to it. <laughs> All right, hey guys, thanks a lot for coming in. Love to have you back. Thank uh, you. Especially after you can see if you can teach are this girl water to, Wolverines. See if you can bring this girl to the bucket and let her drink. John Petrolino is on next. But first, we are so proud to partner with the National Concealed Carry Association as a 10-ring partner. NCCA exists to serve the Second Amendment community by providing a nationwide network of 2A advocates. They offer elite self-defense and concealed carry training from the nation's top instructors and provide rock-bottom prices on the best selection of gear and accessories. Join them today. Members get great prices and free shipping. Learn more about them at National Concealed Carry Association.com. All right. Our guest is John Petrolino. You know John from, uh, he's actually an author and he's uh, he writes a lot of articles, especially for bearingarms.com, all Second Amendment related. And uh, John is just a fantastic uh, friend of the show. He's a uh, uh, real super helpful with San Diego County Gun Owners, Orange County Gun Owners, Riverside County Gun Owners, San Bernardino County Gun Owners. Great guy. A uh, gentleman scholar and a fine judge of scotch, John Petrolino. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you, Michael? Good, man. It's good to hear you. Yeah, it's great to be on the show. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. So tell, so you're you're an author. You write articles. Tell people, describe to people what it, what it is you do. <laughs> okay, so I um, I do write articles. I write for uh, Bearing Arms and Ammo Land News. So uh, it depends on which one of those sites I'm working for at the time, but I, I work on both. Um, I also do do some blog entries for the JM4 Tactical Blog. That's a, a, a holster company in Texas. And um, I also have a book out called Decoding Firearms, which I, I think you're familiar with a little Very bit. Very familiar. Love that book. It's a, it's a it's kind of the ultimate manual for um, for, for gun owners, for, you know, from, from – uh, it's a uh, you know new gun owners, experienced gun owners. It's kind of a reference. It's an educational manual. Um, it's excellent, really excellently uh, done. Big fan. No, no, I, I definitely appreciate it. It's something I, I put together that I wanted to uh, be able to to give to students. And uh, it's funny because it was supposed to be like a handout, a free pamphlet. Where I sat down and I started to make all my notes it was based off of a syllabus that i had written and uh when i got done with everything that i thought this handout or pamphlet should have in it it turned out to be a 266 page book so i said well it's a bit of a (laughs) that's a big pamphlet (laughs) exactly and so uh that's how decoding firearms came about and I, i cover handguns rifles um and shotguns in there so it's not discriminatory to one platform or the other and it's based your basic elementary uh information so it's for for the new people to to get them up on their feet and uh hopefully also motivate them to get some training okay so you write a lot of different articles um excellent excellent work i really enjoy your work um and uh i i'll I'll bet you a lot of people have read your your work without even knowing 
uh, that it was you, which is why I really wanted to bring you on the air and introduce you to people so that people can not just, uh, uh, you know, read your articles because they follow the, you know, Ammo Land and Bearing Arms. I want them to seek out your work because it is well worth it. It's extremely well done and it's very informative. So what's an article recently that, that we that we have to hear about? What's something that's extremely important that you wrote about that, you, that we need to know? There's a couple of things that I have. And this one issue, it's kind of evergreen, and I and I approach it every so often. And this one came out August 18th, so it's a, it's a little bit older. It's a couple of weeks old, but the, the title of the article is The Time to Be an Advocate is Now. And this article talks about why it's important to not just be informed, but also to be an advocate. And, and some of the things that we can do to be an advocate. So for example, the the, the first point that I make in there is talking about the National Second Amendment organizations. There are a whole slew of them. We know what they are. Um, We should know what they are. There's the NRA, obviously, the Second Amendment Foundation, Firearms Policy Coalition, Gun Owners of America. And uh, there's a couple other ones as well. Those are the main ones. I'm just using those as examples. I'm not playing favorites to one or the other. Uh, But that's something that people should be doing at minimum for advocacy is to join these groups that are going to support and defend our civil rights. So what what are some of the uh, and that's, by the way, advocacy is something that we talk about a lot. San Diego County gun owners, all the different gun owner packs in Southern California, uh, you know, enough pontificating, enough meme making. Uh, We we want you to get involved. We want you to actually do something that is productive and important. So why, why so big fan of the article, but why now, like what, what's happening right now that, that, Hey, this is the time to get involved. Well, I mean, as we should all be aware and the listeners should be acutely aware of this, at least we are absolutely under attack on a national level. We are getting it from so many different directions. While we might be gaining a lot of ground In many states, not all states, but we are getting some victories in some states. Like, it's great to see things like permitless carry uh, pass and states that are passing sanctuary status. But on the federal level, we have these attacks from the ATF. We have these legislative attacks. All of these things that are happening, and especially the stuff that's happening on the executive, which um, it shouldn't be. We shouldn't be ruling through executive, but we are. with the current administration, all of these things are going to take money in the form of lawsuits. So those big organizations and groups like San Diego, uh, San Diego County gun owners and all of the affiliate California groups and the uh, state level organizations, these are all really important things to be engaged with. So like we can do, like you said, you know, make the memes and, uh, talk about the uh, silly boating accidents. That's all fun and games, but at minimum, start sending some money to these groups because they are doing the heavy lifting for us. Now, I mean, if, if I were, you know, negative, if I, if I were a glasses half empty guy, I'd say, John, it's over. It's just a matter of time. They keep winning. There's no way we can, especially here in California, we're so outnumbered. Why is there a light at the end of the tunnel, or, or why does the future look bright when it comes to the Second Amendment? Well, if we all had that attitude, it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy because none of us would do anything, and then we wouldn't be able to stop it. Uh, there is, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I do believe there is, and this is going to come in, in a multitude of ways. We have a lot of positive things that have moved up to the Supreme Court. Um, We're waiting on uh, the carry-related case that's supposed to be heard. The New York State Rifle Pistol Association is supposed to be heard uh, November 3rd uh, in the Supreme Court, and that's going to be a big case. Hopefully, hopefully with that case will come instructions that the lower courts are supposed to be listening to these cases involving the Second Amendment under strict scrutiny. That is the slam dunk that we would need. We would need them to overthrow the carry law in in new york and then in effect we would be able to attack all the other bad statutes throughout all the other states and if they were to say strict scrutiny is necessary i do believe that will help us in our litigation um also the midterms are right around the corner 
And I think that there's a, um, a fair chance that more freedom oriented or second amendment loving legislators will be, uh, put into and or kept in office because of the number of people that are seeing what goes along with those that which uh, wish to take away our freedoms. I think, I think people are really um, starting to see the light there. And then cyclically also, generally speaking, in the midterms, uh, most, uh, uh, most administrations, you see a uh, power shift there in the midterm. So we'll see what happens, but I don't think all is lost at all. And you live in the great state of New Jersey, which isn't exactly pro 2A, right? No, this is the one of the most unfriendly Second Amendment states. I feel like New Jersey is in a pissing contest with, Cali- contest with California, Hawaii, uh, and New York. <laughs> you know, I feel like they, they all want to one-up each other. Um, <laughs> and speaking of Hawaii, Hawaii has been uh, you know, there, there's been all kinds of litigation with Hawaii statutes and practices being smacked down left and right. So uh, I've written about that in Bearing Arms as well. You can look that up and Ammo Land. So there's all kinds of victories that are going on in these these really bad states. It's just, uh, you know, it's not a, uh, a matter of when. I think it's a matter, uh, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when uh, these laws all get you know, you shift, you know. So in as as a result of your article about advocacy, now's the time, what is the most effective or important thing that, you know, Joe Lunchbox or Jane Lunchbox can do? You know, they're raising a family, they got kids, they got a, a spouse, they got a job. What's the most important thing, an effective thing that they can do to support the Second Amendment? Uh, the easiest and the freest or the most inexpensive thing to do is to stay engaged with our legislators and write them, tell them what you think. Okay, so that doesn't cost us anything. At minimum, it'll cost us a stamp if we want to be fancy about it and send in a letter, which I recommend people do. I recommend sending in snail mail letters. I recommend people writing emails and write to your legislators about um, on the state at the federal level, letting them know your opinion, letting them know specifics about maybe different bills that are being introduced and why they should not vote for them. That is the easiest thing that they, that could be done, and that does count. Now, whether or not they want to listen, that's that's a whole other animal. Uh, but letting your voice be known is important because this is a republic, and if they're going to represent us, they need to know what we're thinking. So hey, John. Uh, hey, John. Other- we're going to have you go ahead and hang on. We're going to bring you back. Got to take a quick break but there's a part of his terms and conditions for being on the show is he's 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 going to be the answer guy he's got to say the answer are you, oh, you going to have him yeah. do that so he's been practicing all here week. we go gun owners radio fm 96 one am 1170 the answer pr prmi mortgage <laughs> primeres.com slash alpine are you in the military looking for help for a va loan well if you're looking to buy or refi or if you're just considering a reverse mortgage Call our local mortgage guy that you can trust. Call Chris Wiley at PRMI Mortgage. For nearly 25 years, Chris has been helping local San Diegans with all their mortgage needs. Chris Wiley, 619-722-1303, or just go to primeres.com slash alpine. So we're talking with John Petrolino. John, i got to tell you, we we polled uh, everybody here in the studio, um, and – out of uh, out of ten, you got a, a nine point oh by everybody. The German judge gave you a seven. I don't know what happened there, <laughs> but well, it's oh blood the oh blood da. Uh. <laughs> All right, so um, you were just talking about uh, an article you wrote that hey, now's the time. Advocacy is important. Um, that brings me to another article you wrote where you're talking about uh, Queensland in Australia. Um, talk a little bit about that because it, it's kind of hey, this is what could happen if you don't get involved. This is a, a, a even worse than worst case scenario. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, it's funny because the article is Australian town wants to ban bows and arrows, and it was a report that I read, and I'm going through this. Is you've got to be kidding me? And the the whole shtick is there was this. Um, area in North Queensland, and it seems like it's kind of like more Aboriginal people living there, 
and there's some sort of a familial spat between different families. Like you're talking about maybe some ancient stuff that goes way back. Like I don't really know all the particulars, but what was going on is they had this, um, the city council was, you know, talking about trying to come up with a bow and arrow ban. Like they are legitimately, they were discussing banning of bow and arrows because they were having all of these archery related incidents (laughs) or archery arrow violence, I guess. And, uh, these incidents of bowmen doing bowmen stuff. And this is where you're at in Australia, where they've taken it to the nth degree, where they're talking about having archery equipment banned in certain jurisdictions because of bow violence. Bow violence. <laughs> well, I guess that's what it would be, right? Bow violence? If it's, if it's that gun violence... Like- and- you know, with guns, it should be bow violence, and then it's a bowman, right? That sounds like some of the la- lamest <laughs> violence I think I've ever heard of is bow. So, okay, so in Australia, you're saying this sounds like this is like Australia's version of like the Hatfields and the McCoys, and so they're. I'm not. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> That's crazy. So, is this is this now? Is this real? Or is this a, just a suggestion, or is this happening? Or you know, what are the chances of this going on? <laughs> So, I mean, pretty much the uh, city council and everybody that was involved uh, came to the conclusion that this is outside of their jurisdiction, um, that, that this spat and where I guess it's happening. Because, um, you know, they, they don't go like really, really, really deep in, in the article that I reference in here. It's just they're saying that um, – <laughs> One of the quotes was they said that an incident involving archery equipment were occurring on a weekly basis. They're involved with community unrest between various families. And then it, they go on to continue and saying some individual people can take it upon themselves to produce weapons during unrest. So uh, one of the end all things here is that they were saying is they, they're currently working with the elders and a partner agencies to address the issue and that um, including mediation with elders and engagement with the families involved to calm the tension. So like, I guess kind of read between the lines there, um, <laughs> you, you know, there uh, it's clearly an issue there, but again, you're, they're going after the weapons. At least they're bringing forward these mediation efforts. And again, if that's effective, by all means, go go forth. You know they're not going after the criminal; they're going after the the tool, the the you know the assault bow, I guess, bow violence. Right. You remember? You remember <laughs> when you high- remember when you were? You remember the Punisher magazines? You remember the comic books, The Punisher? I'm pretty sure, sure. one. Of, I'm pretty sure one of the bad guys he fought was bow violence. Like I'm pretty sure. I don't remember, but. That's ridiculous. How did you find now? How did you how, obviously not from Australia? How did you uh, how did you trip across that story? I um, I actually subscribe to some Australian related um, sites so that I can get these ridiculous articles, you know, so I so I can get this news. It was like the, their gun amnesty that they had. I mean, you'll see things that pop up in my writing. There are some. Um, some of the, you know, you know frequent flyers in, in my work would be Hawaii, California, New Jersey, um, not as much New York as you would believe, but a little bit New York, Massachusetts for sure, and Australia. Like, I feel like I'm constantly writing about these areas with a bunch of other areas sprinkled in. Um, and I just you look at the ridiculousness of, of the laws in these areas, and Australia is a prime example of why why advocacy is so important hey john were they talking about uh bow registration as a (laughs) as a first step to controlling this bow violence crisis they have that's a question from joe violence (laughs) i think i think they were just trying to bogart them (laughs) (laughs) that's ridiculous okay so one of the other ridiculous things that popped up that i know you wrote about recently was uh how doctors are weighing in on on firearm storage. Talk a little bit about that because firearm storage and, and some of those, uh, 
ridiculous laws and, what, and some of the requirements actually are happening here in San Diego, in the city of San Diego particularly. And there was at least one physician, one medical doctor, who showed up and talk, or spoke at the city council meeting. And guess what? She was from Australia, by the way. So talk a little bit <laughs> about that. That give it, nothing goes better than talking gun banning with such an accent. Um, <laughs> so this one was talking about a op-ed. There was this op-ed in a Tennessee uh, newspaper, the Tennessean, which is a Gannett paper, which is USA Today is their their flagship piece, uh, their flagship um, publication. And um, like I get it, like I get the 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 uh, the flavor of the of the sentiments and. Uh, these six physicians banded together to do this uh, op-ed, and they're looking for funds to, to educate on the safe storage of firearms, which I think everybody here on this panel uh, tonight discussing this on the, on the show, like, yeah, that'd be great if the, the state ponied up funds to uh, give out free firearm safety education, right? I, I think that would be cool, but the real thing is it's got to be by the people who know what they're doing. And you look at the American Academy of Pediatricians and uh, Dr. John Adeen talks about this all the time. And it's also talked about in this article and Dr. John, he's from um, doctors for responsible gun owners. Uh, he talks about this all the time and saying like the American Academy of Pediatricians, they say, okay, your safe storage of your firearm is the following firearm unloaded in a locked container ammunition in a separate locked container. So you want an unloaded firearm in a locked box and an ammunition in a separate container that's also locked separate from the firearm. If anybody could tell me how that's going to be effective in, um, in a self-defense situation, I'm, I'm all ears. You know, I want a doctor weighing in on my gun rights and weighing in on my gun storage habits and weighing in on firearms in general as much as any doctor wants me weighing in on, you know, the prescription strength of any drug. Yeah, I, oh, absolutely. I don't want them anywhere near it. We can jump on at WebMD, you know, and we could just go ahead and start giving out our diagnoses, you know. That's right. I've so, had a, um, Listen, I've had a cold before, so I think I know a little something about prescriptions, right? Right, absolutely. It makes about that uh, much sense. So I wouldn't have a problem for this. However... They go forward in talking about, again, the firearm separate from the ammunition, locked container. They don't go into the possibilities that, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Not every storage solution is perfect for every person or every family. There's no one size fits all. And they go in with biased language. I mean, the first thing, the teaser, the teaser excerpt, and I'm sure this is from the editorial staff was, Tennessee's new permitless carry law that went into effect on July 1st carries hazards, especially for children and teens who may be tempted to misuse a firearm if it's not stored properly. Again, explain to me, anybody, how permitless carry translates to firearms not being stored properly. Jeez. So There's zero correlation there. So, John, does anybody address, you know, when you, you hear these people talk about this stuff, I mean, you know, un injuries and fatalities to children because of of uh, dumb gun owners, I guess, is, you know, it's tragic. But the numbers are, you know, less than 500, I think, a year uh, is typically what we have with those kinds of fatalities out of 340 million people. I mean, it's it's tragic, but it's hardly a crisis that, that we have to scramble over. I mean, if you want to be more effective, why don't we deal with swimming pool deaths or something? Lots well, uh, more thing. kids so die that way. You hit, you hit the nail on the head. Toddler-aged children, I think, you know, even it's zero to four or whatever the, the age range is, more children die in swimming pools than they do to firearms in that toddler age range. So, you know, we, we a lot of towns require us to put fences around pool. That's safe. Pool storage, is it not? Uh, and yet these incidents happen. Well, again, you can only legislate so far, too. I mean, some people are just, that's the way they are, and you can't fix some people. They're just not going to be responsible. But, I mean, you know, we, we go through these things, and you hear this bad information over and over again. We had the uh, the sheriff from L.A. County on here a couple of weeks ago quoting the, mm -hmm. um, 
quoting that old debunked study about your, um, you know, if you have a gun in the house, you're five times more likely to shoot yourself with a gun or something like that. And it's like that thing's right. been debunked a million times, and yet they're still out there pushing that around. Well, and doctors yep. talking about this stuff. How many people die of medical malpractice every year? <laughs> right, and that's I mean, something I talked about here. So the and this quote I got this from Dr. Robert B. Young, MD, from also from Doctors for Responsible Gun Owners, and he gave me the following quote: four hundred thousand deaths, and he said give or take two hundred thousand, which is <laughs> fine, right? So you're still at two hundred to six hundred thousand uh, deaths yearly due to health care provider mistakes. Oh. So these doctors that want to weigh in are killing 200 to 600,000 people a year due to malpractice. I think you need to stay in your lane and keep after your own house. Wow. John Petrolino, awesome. I Thank appreciate you. it so much. How do people find you? Uh, JohnPetrolino.com is the easiest way to find everything John Petrolino. And uh, there's a way to contact me there as well. For those of you who would like to contact me, I'm always looking for news tips. You got to get, I'll tell you, we got a guy here in, in the studio, Brett. He's got a shirt with his face on it. We need a John Petrolino shirt with your face on it. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm all game. Like, we can make it happen. <laughs> We'd put a shirt with my face on it, but it has to be a really big shirt. And it'd be um, really scary. Hey, we live in a state where your self defense rights are under attack. Let us be your voice to help defend and restore the Second Amendment. Help spread the word about the fight. There's two easy things you can do. One, like and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, Instagram, uh, the podcast, or where, wherever you uh, like to listen to the show. Second, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps boost the show and puts us in front of a whole lot more people. All right, we got Stump, my nephew. Hey, Sam, how's it going? Good. How are you guys? Uh, you know, just hanging in here. Got a house full of people. Yeah, got a lot of people here. You been listening to the show, or did you just tune in? Um, no, I just tuned in. We have a couple of uh, um, uh, former special ops guys from the Coast Guard. They're now firearms trainers, and they're going to uh, they're going to help us by uh, asking the question. For those who are tuning in for the first time, Sam, the gunman, is my nephew. Every week, uh, he calls in. Someone writes in, sends us a, a trivia question that has to do with guns. And if we use your question, you get a shirt or a hat. We'll send it right to you. If you stump my nephew, then you get a front sight uh, membership, which is basically firearms training for life. Uh, you, you get to go pistol, rifle, shotgun, any one of their classes for life. But very, very few of you are able to stump my nephew. So uh, Mike from Christensen Combatives, he's going to read the question. All right, Sam, how's it going over there? Great. How are you? Good. All right. So this one's coming from Emily from Mission Viejo. And her question that goes, name three out of the five improvements Six Hour implemented to fix the P320's drop safety failure. Name three of the five improvements that uh, Six Hour implemented to, to fix the P320's drop safety errors. Um, so a little bit of background for those of you who don't know. Um, the P320 is a relatively new design. It's only been available for a few years. And when the U.S. Department of Defense officially adopted it, uh, or variants thereof, to replace the M9 and other pistols that were already in service, um, they found that there were issues where the pistols may go off um, when dropped, which is obviously not a good thing. Now, I, I didn't read too much up on the technical details around this uh, when that was coming out, but as I recall, um, the issue was that the trigger itself was too heavy. So, again, I'm, I, I may be wrong on this stuff. I think they stiffened the return spring, um, changed the geometry of the safety plunger, but I might be wrong on that. And I want to say something to do with the angle of the sear, but I'm not positive. So, well, that's three of them. So, upgraded the sear housing geometry is, is exactly what you just said. Which one do you got? Mike, are you a, are you a gunsmith? Uh, aspiring gunsmith. Aspiring gunsmith? <laughs> so, the, the, that first one, I think, is he covered it, just said a little different. Yeah. yeah. So, reduce the mass trigger shoe, right? Yep. And yeah, then, so that uh, the momentum wouldn't carry it all the way back, 
and uh, discharge the firearm. And what did you say about the safety? Re- repeat that part. Um, I, I think they changed the geometry of the safety plunger inside, uh, which also acts as um, an out-of-battery safety. It kind of does two jobs. I like how uh, I'm not smart okay. enough to determine if he even got the answer right. <laughs> I give it to him. I that, that, sound, that sounds like a disconnect, doesn't disconnect. it? Yeah, that's <laughs> I think so. Okay, so here's the here are the five things that Emily from Mission Viejo uh, did: reduced mass trigger shoe, which I believe you 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 described; reduced mass striker, um, which you, you didn't describe. That's one of the five things: reduced mass sear, trigger disconnect safety, and then upgraded the sear housing geometry. I believe that you got three of those. Just said it in a little little different way yeah but he got all three yeah we're getting the, the special op guys are all nodding their head yes and giving us a thumbs up so especially all, the i'm not gonna argue with the them. wannabe gunsmith yeah i'm not gonna argue with them yeah how do you why did you why do you know that because it's news uh, it was kind of big news uh when that came it was out kind of big right news after, right after they adopted the 320 in 2017 i remember uh, dan rather covering that and it, uh the for various bureaucratic reasons the army who was leading the MHS program was very, very pressed for time, and they did not put the pistol through complete field trials before adopting it. Uh, so some issues that may have been worked out earlier were found immediately after that, um, namely uh, the, the drop safety issue that the question was about, which manifested itself when the pistol was dropped specifically at a certain angle such that the rear of the pistol hit the ground first. So the P320, the six-hour P320, was the one that the Army uh, adopted? Yeah, they adopted it as the M17, and the M18, which the Marine Corps and some other services are using, is the same thing, just with with a shorter slot. Mike, how do you like the the, the 320? Have you, uh, me, me and Brett are both big fans of the P320. I have just a stock one. I don't have the 17 or 18, uh, and then I have the uh, X5 Legion as well. What's the X5 Legion? Uh, Sig's one of the only uh, companies so far they've taken a uh, paraffin-based um, weight and put it in the actual receiver itself, so it almost counterbalances like a like a well-balanced knife. So it helps to reduce recoil, adds a little bit of weight, kind of reduce that muzzle flip. Were you guys Sig guys before, or is this a new? Yeah, in the Coast Guard we use the uh, uh, Sig uh, 229 DAC R, which it's not a very great weapon, but now that everyone's transitioning to this 320, it is. Is well better than the Beretta that most of the services are using, and uh, yeah, I would support it. Why? You, know, you said it wasn't a great weapon. Why wasn't it at the time? The uh, 229 DAC R it had two different triggers, where one would be super long, and then you had an intermediate reset that you would have to physically feel to get your lighter trigger pull to come back. Hmm. So it was very difficult going from a Beretta to this two-stage trigger, which now the 320 has taken all that out. Brett, what do you carry every day? If you're if you're carrying. For self defense, what do you? Carry? My uh, everyday carries the three twenty uh, X carry oh, with wow. a uh, red dot on it. Mike, what are you carrying? Same thing. Wow. All right. Jeez. <laughs> what are you carrying, Mike? Uh, Glock nineteen. There you go. Yeah. I don't well, know if we, you guys have heard of it. to convert you. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, our CEO Wendy, she's she's a big Sig fan. I'm 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 very simple minded, so I go Glock. I, I'm not that complicated a guy. No, like Mike said though, the two two nine hated that platform in the Coast Guard. The 320, though, absolutely love it. I've got a few different configurations. Kept dropping them over the overboard. Yeah, I don't know. It just I, fell yeah, out of exactly. my holster. <laughs> Sam, Started making some lan- lanterns on them. <laughs> Sam, what are you carrying? <laughs> um, I carry a Glock 43X personally uh, because I'm a small person with small hands, and it fits me great. There you go. All right, my friend, excellent job again. We didn't stump you. In fact, like I said, your, your answers were even smarter than – you know, then, then, then Emily, then the answers that Emily, then the sorry, answer, Emily. Yeah, so. <laughs> Excellent job, man. Fantastic. Take care, buddy. Thanks for having me on. And a uh, great question. Really, uh, really difficult technical question. Well, you did awesome. Trust me. Like our two guys are sitting here shaking their head. Cause he's yeah. Cause we kind of pre-warned him what you were going to do. That's how confident we are. There you go. <laughs> All right, man. Talk to you soon, Sam. Yeah. See you later. Have a good night, everyone. And now it's time for your weekly mic drop. We don't have the mic drops. So mic, mic drop. <laughs> this week's mic drop is uh, about the Board of Supervisors, the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. If you're not familiar with the Board of Supervisors, does 
with, well, I should say what they are supposed to do is they basically act like a city council for the county. Uh, so if you live in the unincorporated areas, they make decisions about, uh, you know, business licensing and land use, that sort of thing. Um, what they shouldn't be doing is making decisions uh, that limit your First Amendment rights. But that's exactly what they're doing. Now, throughout the entire history of San Diego County, the board has been made up of Republicans. And up until just a couple of years ago, it was all five Republicans. Now, I am not a Republican, nor am I a fanboy of the Republican Party. They have a lot of problems. But the Democrats promised that, hey, if you put us in charge, things are going to go even better. And frankly, on the county level, things were going really, really well. The roads were paved. The, ba the budget was balanced. First responders had their budget. Uh, law enforcement, ambulance, it, it was all going really, really well. Uh, and Well, now we have three Democrats. We have two Republicans. And things are going to hell in a handbasket, mostly because of COVID. Now, I'm going to read you a quote here. I fully support the First Amendment and people's right to say and believe what they want, but we also have the right and responsibility to call out things that are objectively false. This is a quote from Board of Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. This guy is as dangerous a, a, a politician as they come. And what they voted on last week was to limit your rights, your First Amendment rights, to say what you believe. Um, this wasn't just a, hey, if you're trying to fool somebody or if you're lying or you're trying to screw somebody out of money, then, yeah, there are going to be consequences. No, this just has to do with your, 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 um, uh, your opinion. They're actually saying, hey, your opinion, if we don't agree with it, is actually a health crisis. And they voted on this three to two, three to two, three Democrats, all three, decided that your First Amendment right was was far too dangerous. It was a health violation. Uh, the two Republicans spoke out against it and said, no, 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 this is way too far. So, you know, elections have consequences. And a lot of voters said, all right, we're going to trust these three people that are lockstep in their, in their political opinions with the entire county board. I think it's time to reverse it. We're coming up uh, in, in an election year. And uh, there's going to be some names on the ballot. We got to make sure that when when we uh, when we endorse, when we put our, our our dime and our time into candidates, that they aren't the ones that are currently on the board. That's this week's mic drop. Mic drop. Anyway, hey, we want to thank first having our guests in today. It was fantastic. But everybody, subscribe to our podcast. Just search Gun Owner Radios, and you'll find us. Leave a five star review to help the word get out, and please support our great sponsors. San Diego County Gun Owners, U.S. Law Shield, the Dillon Law Group, PRMI Mortgage, 365 Glacier Payment, Scott Vision, uh, Coldwall Banker, Royal Realty, and National Concealed Carry Association. Thanks to Joe Jermisi, Michael Schwartz, and uh, Melissa Lee, and, of course, our board op. Chris, thank you for all the hard work that you've done. And, folks, keep listening, share the show with all your friends, and together we will make a difference. This is Gun Owners Radio. FM 961 AM 1170. The answer.